My name is Rulin Olikin. I was born in September 26, 1941, and I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. How did you get involved with mining in Utah? <laughs> uh, I think probably it was with uh, Atlas Dirty Devil right here in uh, Wayne County. I was working for the county road and they were talking about doing a strip mine out by Factory Butte and uh, I saw a chance to better my pay and, and do something different. So I went to work for Atlas Dirty Devil. When was mine. this? Uh, I think this was in 1977 when they started to develop the area down there. And I went to work for, for them then. Was that a the, uranium mine? No, it was a strip coal mine. I started out just running equipment, uh, developing it, putting in the, the structures, uh, building it, constructing the, the setup for processing the, the coal. And then after that, then I was uh, in charge of loading the, the trucks that come in to pick the coal up and that was hauled to Green River. Hatchco was a trucking company that hauled it to Green River, Utah, and then it was put on the train and it was sent to uh, Moapa, Nevada, to the uh, power plant in Moapa, Nevada, hmm. Nevada Power. I went from there to work uh, with the uh, operating engineers, building highways, road construction for a couple of years, and then uh, got a job at uh, Tickaboo, at uh, Shootering Canyon Mine. So by the time you got to Tickaboo, they were shutting down their operation. Yeah, Tickaboo had run for quite a while, and then uh, the market for uranium uh, or collapsed and they could get it cheaper from Canada and Australia so they pretty well phased out. And was it just the one mine, the shootering mine? Just the shootering mine, yes. It was the only one that was operating then. Did they have more than just a mine in shootering? Uh, they had the, the town site, Tickaboo and the, and the motel there at uh, Tickaboo area. And then they had a school and a town site and they were they were renting out, or they were selling property to build homes on because it was just 12 miles out of Bullfrog Basin on Lake Powell, so it was kind of a recreation area also. So it was all kind of combined with the mining operation. And it was going pretty good until the uranium market kind of fell apart. And then with all mining things, the people moved out and the town kind of just went into, what would you say, kind of a hibernation. <laughs> Do you know how Shootering got its name? Uh, yeah, this is a story that was told to me by uh, Larry Ecker from Hangsville. And I guess it was the Eckers who were prospecting for uranium during the 50s, during the uranium boom. They had been down in Shootering Canyon and they'd seen a vein in the ledge where Shootering Canyon is, but, but you couldn't get to it. There was no way to get up there. So I guess it was his uncles, the Eckers, put a canvas tarp down below the ledge, and then they got on the other side of the canyon with their rifles, and they started shooting at the ledge to break pieces of the ledge off to fall down on the canvas. And that's how it's got its name, is shootering. They shot the ledge down to get enough to take into Grand Junction to get it assayed to see if it was worth mining. And evidently, it was worth mining. Do you know how many people worked there? At one time, I think there was about four or five hundred at the height before I got there. It was when they were still developing it. So it was a pretty good sized mine. And by the time you got there, what was the workforce like? It was around 300 altogether, both shifts. So, so they ran a day shift in a graveyard? Yeah, they ran a day in a grave for 24 hours. Because uh, at Tickaboo down there, they had to generate their own power, so you had to have somebody on duty all the time because they had to generate their own electricity down there, they had their own power station and everything. So it was a 24-hour operation. Describe what the inside of that mine looked like. <laughs> it was huge. It just it was all in solid sandstone. There was no, no cribbing. It was just in solid rock. And they had what they call pillar and pull method where they used leaf pillars of, of the stone to hold the mine up. And it was all just 
solid rock and back to where they were drilling, it was, there was a lot of water. It's hard to believe there's that much water underground there. They'd be working up to their knees in water and they'd be drilling into the face and there'd be water coming out of the drill holes. Really? There's that much water, yeah. And what did they do with that water? Uh, they pumped it out and they had what they called a holding pond up above where they held the water to let it evaporate. Basically, there was a big lake. Well, it was not a lake, but a pond, a fairly good sized pond. How big an underground operation was the shooter in? It was big. You could drive a Jeep back in. They had two portals, east and west portals, and you could drive a Jeep all the way back into the mine. On both portals, they'd have uh, the Getman ore buggies that were about the size of the little Jeep Universal. And it was big enough you could drive back in the main two. Then they had the stopes off from there, different, uh, what would you call that? <laughs> the permitting, because the, the mine was owned by different people, had different, uh, what do they call them? Uh, royalties? Royalties, yeah, the royalties. So we had to keep track of the royalties, and every stope or each drift off from the side of the main shafts. They'd have to keep track of whose they were. So it was a pretty complex operation when you get down to it. It's not like the old like the old mine where they just went in and dug it out and took it out and everything was okay. Now it was had a lot of things to keep track of. After they blasted on the face and had their muck pile, how was that removed from the mine, do you know? They had uh, the the loaders. And they loaded into the get manure buggies, and it was—it would come out. It'd be almost like soup. It'd be that wet. It'd depend on which part of the mine they were mining, it would come out and be almost like a slurry. And then they'd dump it in some bins outside of the mine, depending on which royalty it come from. They would dump it there, and then it would be hauled from there down the canyon. It'd be stockpiled in different areas for the royalties. So the Those royalties were always kept separate. Separate, yeah. They kept the separate, yes, because it. Depends on who gets paid for it for the royalties of it, the section it come from. So there was, it seemed like there was seven royalties, seven bins we had out there where they hauled, depending on which day they were hauling from, you knew where, which bin went to which part of the canyon where they stored the, the ore that was going to be hauled down to the mill. The mill was separate, it was on down the canyon, and then the mill would pick up whatever they wanted, taken down to the mill. They'd, after it dried out, they'd haul it down there. The was, the, was the mill operating when you went to work? Uh, it was just barely starting to operate, and they ran it for not quite a year, I think, where they processed some of the ore, turned it into yellow cake. And the, at the time they started that mill up, it was the most advanced mill in, in the United States. It was all, all computerized and uh, it was one of the most modern mills in the United States at the time. Going back to the shooter ring mine, um, what's your most memorable story from being at that mine? I think it was underground looking at the, uh, we'd go underground, the miners would come and tell us that they would saw something in the ceiling and we'd go underground. I think the, most memorable thing was to see the giant dinosaur track in the ceiling of the mine where part of the ledge had come down and separated and there was this gigantic big dinosaur footprint in the ceiling of that mine. It was something to see. Uh, and then just working in the area. Uh, you have to be a desert rat or something that, or they call it slick rock country, yeah. Uh, gets in your blood and just, just being there, just being part of it. And what were you doing outside the mine? Uh, during the day I was outside basically doing the reclamation work. I was out with uh, the guys that were building the sites. We'd have to go out and find out where they were at and then figure out how we could build a road and a, and a pad to put the drill rig on. Because the drill rig is a tandem axle truck, so you had to have a pretty good size space to put it on and then get the truck out there. So we spent most of our time just building the pads, the roads into the pads, setting the pads up. And then lots of times it was steep enough we'd have to go out and tow the drill rig up to the pad to get it set up. And then we'd stay there with the truck till they, the drillers till they got it done. And then either help the pad, uh, drill rig off the pad and then move it to the next area. Because lots of times 
the trucks weren't powerful enough, so we had to pull the rigs up to the pads or off of the pads. And so it was, most of the time was spent out doing assessment, drilling and cleaning it up 90% of the time. When you had to assist these drill of trucks to get there, you were using a caterpillar with a winch? Uh, yeah, winch or we just took the chain and a cable to the blade and pulled them up or pushed them up and then uh, hook onto the dozer to let them go down a steep grade. We hook onto the dozer and then put the ripper down and slide them, slide them down the road. So you were involved in closing down shootering? Uh, yeah, what I did was I did the uh, reclamation work, cleaning up old tailings piles, and their assessment drilling work was all over the Henry, so I'd go out and clean up all the drill sites where they did their assessment drilling, uh, where they had to, uh, their pits when they were drilling for the mud slurry they put down the pits, I'd go out and clean those up, reseed it all, and take care of that, and also take care of the town of Tickaboo. Uh, landscaping and that sort of thing. So when you say you cleaned up at a drilling site, what did that specifically involve? Well usually if, because uh, the area it was in, they had to build roads into ledges and on the slopes and we'd go in and uh, where the drill site was, where the well was, where the hole was they drilled for the assessment that had plastic pipe down in it, we'd close that off and then cover it and then bring a cat or a tractor in and slope it. And then in the fall, go back out with a tractor and a disc and reseed it and disc it in. And to uh, just kind of blend it back in with the surroundings again. Did your reclamation activities happen only on the Henry's or were you involved in reclaiming the shootering? Uh, it was all shootering uh, on the Henry's south, south, southwest slope the Henry's and then uh, we did some cleanup, oh, I was trying to name of it, uh, over on North Creek, North Wash, on the east side of the Henry's. They had some claims out there and then I'd go over to uh, Blanding to Shirtel Junction. They had an ore buying station there that we had to keep cleaned and track of and keep track of the radiation levels around the ore buying station there at Shirtel Junction. Now when you say keep it clean, what does that actually mean? Well, they'd grow up with tumbleweeds and weeds, and uh, we had to keep it looking nice, and the environmental girl would go over and check the radiation levels on the ground around the ore buying station, and just keep it looking presentable, uh, clean up any trash, make sure everything was, what would you say, looking nice so it didn't uh, cause a lot of concern to the public. And this was a Plateau Resources buying station? Yeah, it was uh, over at uh, Shirtail Junction, belonged to Plateau Resources. They, they would buy and trade ore with uh, energy fuels rather than ship, energy fuels rather than shipping ore from over, they had some claims over by Shootering Canyon, rather than shipping the ore clear over to Shirtail Junction or over to their mine in, uh, over in that area, they would trade ore with uh, plateau, because Plateau had some ore over there, they'd, they'd trade ore back and forth rather than ship it so far, because the shipping costs out in that area was quite expensive because of the mileage they have to travel. To, so they traded ore back and forth. Kind of a... On what basis was the trade? It couldn't have been just volume, it had to have been concentration. Of Con the yeah, it would go by the concentration of the ore, first of all, yeah. It had to be, they had to be fairly close to uh, justify doing that, trading the ore back and forth. Because uh, Energy Fuels had a, some number of mines, locations just out of Hanksville, where they were buying it. And uh, so they, they'd work switching ore back and forth. And what happened after the Tickapoo job ended? Uh, I went back to work for the Park Service for two years. Uh, and then the Park Service has this thing where sometimes they think it's better to contract out rather than have in-house doing their work. So I was over the campgrounds and roadside at Zions. So they decided they were going to contract it out, so they let us go. And I happened to be looking at the unemployment office one day, and there was a reclamation job for Dogham.
Division Oil, Gas, and Mining. So I thought, what the heck? So I filled out a thing and sent up, and they asked me to come up to interview at Salt Lake. So I went up to Salt Lake to dog and guess who was there? Ken May, who was over Tickaboo. <laughs> and so I got a job working for uh, the Abandoned Mine Reclamation Program uh, through the state. Where's the first place they sent you? Uh, the first week I went with Lee Spencer out to uh, Eureka, out to the Bullion Beck Mine, right in the town of Eureka, to see what they were doing. And the first main projects with Dogham was uh, out to Vernal, the old coal mines in Vernal, out in that area, in Steinecker, in that area. To go out there, and I can't remember. I, was trying, I think it was Mitchell Construction had the... Uh, they were closing the old mines up out there, and I was the inspector for the state to make sure that all the contract was fulfilled the way the state wanted it. So I was over the construction of it. It was kind of nice because I grew up in Roosevelt, Utah, which is right next to Vernal. So I knew a couple of the old mines because I can remember going with my dad to get coal when we lived in Roosevelt, one of those mines up there. And I think it was the Rasmussen mine that we closed. So. That was the first project, was at Vernal. They sold to the citizens right out of the mine. Yeah, right out of the mines, yeah. They sold, there, there, there were kind of small mines out there, uh, but yeah, they sold straight, straight to the people from that area. Just go out through your truck and pick up the coal. What's it mean to close up a coal mine? What they do is they go into the vertical, sh or the horizontal shaft, they add it, and they take cinder blocks and they block it off so people can't get back into it because they've had a number of problems with kids, youngsters getting in and they're getting lost and then they've had a few people get into them and get into what they call black damp where there's no oxygen and it'll kill you. And so they'd go in at the portal and they'd go in just far enough to find solid ground and then they'd build a block wall uh, to close the mine off and then they'd backfill up against the block wall uh, to close it off and if there's any water coming out then they'd leave a place for the water and they also put in a, a sensor for uh, gas for uh, the gas in the mines the methane keep track of how much methane was underground so it was basically all cinder block and then uh, backfill so uh, what did they backfill with uh, just the the dirt that was around that would probably come out from the mine when the mining so process they, was going on. They'd use the waste dump material? They'd use the waste dump, put up against it, and then reseed it, close it off. What about the structures outside, tipples uh, or whatever? Most of the structures uh, at Spring Canyon helped. They left because it's kind of a historic. A lot of them we have to watch because uh, they were historic. A lot of the mine portals had the name of the mine on it and the year it was started, so uh, we weren't allowed to destroy that. One's up Gora, uh, Spring Canyon and Helper, they were all brick and rock, some beautiful rock work, so they didn't, they didn't destroy them, they left them. I know the one at Sow Belly, the office was there and still had the safe in it. The roof and that was all gone, but it was beautiful rock work, so they left it. It wasn't, wasn't destroyed. And they went to Cedar City, up uh, Cedar Canyon, and that's where... Up Cedar Canyon is one of the first coal mines in the state of Utah was started for the, uh, the iron mines, the iron mission. When the pioneers come down there to make iron, there was a coal mine up Cedar Canyon, up right up the, just above Milt Stage Stop. The, you couldn't find the mine no more because it was right at creek level and the, the creek flooded into the mine and closed it off. But uh, up right hand canyon was uh, the Webster's 1 and 2, Tucker. The Layerson, and then right up Cedar Canyon, up U14, right up on the ledge of the road goes up Cedar Canyon to Cedar Breaks. There was the McFarland mine. It was right on the ledge there, right off the road. You could drive right by it. And that was the last one we went to. And how did you reclaim those? Ah, uh, those were a lot of work because they're on the ledge. Uh, the McFarland, they pulled it all down, blocked it up, and the old mine maintenance shed above there, they pulled it down because it was right on the ledge above the road and they worried about it sliding off onto the highway. And the rest of them were all blocked off up right hand canyon, the Webster, uh, the Tucker, 
and then they removed all the coal sla all the coal waste and tailings, and they took it down and they buried it in a open space down there. They took scrapers and dug a hole and buried all the the coal waste, and then they had a uh, distribution area just below Milt stage stop, and it was on fire. So they broke it open and then buried it with scrapers, and then covered it over with dirt and reseeded it. Did that put the fire out? Yeah, that was quite a thing when they broke that up. You didn't think it was burning that bad, but it, when they broke that open, it just you couldn't believe it. And this was uh, in September, and it was it was steaming and hot, and it was on fire. I remember when they broke into it with a cat, it just burst into flames because it had been smoldering that long. And it was something to see. During the 50s, when they were having the scares with the Russians and that, they buried a lot of uh, civil defense hospital stuff and that in those mine shafts. Well, it all caved in. They couldn't get it out no more. But it was still in there when they buried it. Because uh, the Cedars mines had a problem. It was so steep that the, the ledges just sliced the the mines off, they just slid down and closed them all off. So we basically cleaned up just the uh, tailings and the coal waste and buried it and reseeded it all. Have you been back to those areas? Uh, yes, I go back just about every year when I go past Cedar. How do they I'll, look? It's getting to where you can't even tell where they are anymore, most of them. The Webster 1 and 2 because it was on a ledge and so <laughs> steep that uh, you can still see where the, the tailings were, but the rest of it, you can't even tell where they were. And the McFarland up Cedar Canyon, well, the whole canyon slid off because it closed the road for about a year. It, it's all gone now. It's, it's totally just, the whole ledge just slipped off over it. So it's all gone. And the, the distribution point down by Milt Stage Stop, you can't, you can't even recognize it. It's all grown back. The receding took hold real good. And, was that the long-term goal of the reclamation, is just make it visually disappear? Yeah, a well, big part of it was to get rid of the, uh, the tailings and uh, coal waste, because like in Cedar Canyon, the coal waste was on fire, and it posed, posed quite a problem. Uh, there was one up uh, by Castle Gate. I, didn't, I wasn't involved in this one, but uh, right off the highway going up to Salt Lake, out of price. A lot along the river, it was going off into the river, and it was on fire. I can remember as a kid during the war that they had that coal waste piled out, and it was burning there at night because when you drive up the highway, you could see the fire over there against the Price River. And they were worried about all that stuff going down the river. So the biggest thing with the coal mines was closing the portals off so that people couldn't get back into them. And the other was to clean up the coal waste. And there was one mine up helper up Spring Canyon that had a lot of methane gas coming out of it and it had a big oh I'd say it's about an eight foot culvert that went down into one of the ventilation shafts and uh, we pumped we hauled what eight truckloads of cement poured down in there to close that off to keep the gas from coming out. What were your visual goals at coal mines? Uh, basically to clean up the coal waste, because coal waste, you can't grow anything in coal. So the main thing was to uh, get rid of the coal waste, and part of it was you either got to get rid of it and bury it, or you have to mix it with enough soil so something will grow on it. And so basically just to clean it up, and there was a lot of, a lot of stuff left laying around the old mines, you know, just rails and track and old tin shacks and all kinds of garbage and so a lot of that was buried and then along with the coal waste and then they stir it up either try to bury it and then reseed it to make it look halfway decent you can't always reclaim it back to natural so all you can do is reclaim it and restore it so that it will start growing back to something you can never totally restore it back to natural do you uh, ever have any close calls only one at the uh, Cedar City mine was uh, in the winter, closing the uh, McFarland mine off, and uh, the fog had come through the canyon there, and I was waiting for him to bring a piece of equipment up, and I heard a ledge break off. And I'm standing on the road, and I couldn't see nothing. I'm wondering where this rock's going to come out at, where the ledge was, because I could hear it coming through the trees, and I thought, 
Couldn't tell where it's going to come, but I could hear it coming down. I thought, holy cow, I hope I can see that in time to run. And it come out right below us. Bounced off the ledge, hit the road, and bounced down onto Coal Creek. But you could hear the whole ledge just break, wow. just naturally. Come rolling down through there, and it's like, it's so foggy, you couldn't see nothing. It's like, boy, I hope it doesn't come where we're at. Like I always said, mining's boomer bust. That's what the guys always told me. It's boomer bust. And when I lived in that tickaboo there with my cousin and his trailer, they said, well, we're just a bunch of trampers. We just tramp from one mine to the next. And uh, they're all a bunch of real rough, tough, wild guys, miners, but they'll give you the shirt off your back if you need help. And uh, sooner or later, if you stay in mining, you'll run into them again. Quite an experience. I never planned on being a, a miner or involved in mining, but it turned out to be real good, real enjoyable.